Hello and welcome to Signature TV News This Hour. I'm Charles Pius. We start with sports where Nigerian's chess master Tunde Onakoya has emerged victorious in his quest to set a new world record for the longest chess marathon. Though he originally set out to do 58 hours, Onakoya persevered for a grueling 60 hours before finally halting his historic challenge in Times Square, New York City. His achievement shatters the previous record of 56 hours, 9 minutes and 37 seconds set by Harvard's Hog Flatterbo and Josh Fackenstad of Norway in November 2018. Upon approval by the Guinness World Records, Onakoya's feat will officially eclipse the nearly six-year-old record. Onakoya's record-breaking attempt has garnered immense attention, filled not only by the ambitious time goal, but also by his mission to raise $1 million for underprivileged children worldwide. Nigeria's security architecture has deteriorated due to conflicts and acts of violent extremism by non-state actors in possession of small arms and light weapons. The Southeast Zone of the Center for the Control of Small Arms and Light Weapons organized a seminar which focused on human suffering caused by armed violence in the Southeast region. Correspondent Chinemerem Ikebunam was at the seminar. In recent years, Nigerian security landscape has faced enormous challenges stemming from conflicts and violent extremism. The situation is made worse by the proliferation of small arms and light weapons, leading to armed conflicts, displacement of citizens, organized crimes, and acts of terrorism. It was to address the worrisome development and threats posed to the security, peace, and development of the country that the federal government established the National Center for the Control of Small Arms and Light Weapons in 2021. The center has the mandate to combat the proliferation of small arms with the framework of various international protocols and instruments of which Nigeria is a signatory. It is in furtherance of this mandate that the Southeast Zonal Office of the National Center for the Control of Small Arms and Light Weapons, led by Major General Ogechuku Ugo, organized a one-day seminar in Enugu to highlight the human suffering caused by armed violence in the Southeast region. There is a need to sensitize the public about the existence of the center and to share with the public our vision, our mission, and our objectives. Basically, that's why we invited members of the press and uh, members of the civil society organizations and, of course, our members of the security agencies to partner with us in this fight against the proliferation of illicit arms and light weapons, which is causing a lot of problems for us in uh, Nigeria and globally as a whole. The weapons themselves don't cause trouble. It is the recklessness of use is the easy access to them that causes uh, lethal uh, injuries and uh, gets uh, conflicts protracted unnecessarily. So while our security agencies are fighting these menace with what we call the kinetic force, our center is approaching it from the non-kinetic angle. Uh, trying to talk to advocate and uh, uh, appeal to the conscience of our citizenry not to involve themselves in illegally possessing arms that they don't need. Speaking on the occasion, Brigadier General M. M. Abu of the 82 Division of the Nigerian Army prescribed capital punishment for anyone found in possession of illicit arms. He highlighted the severity of insecurity loss of lives, properties, and livelihoods linked to illegal possession of arms. The two major problems in Nigeria are CAD, CAD, corruption, arms and drugs. I have the opportunity of serving in all the states in Nigeria. I was the operation officer from Sokoto to Medugudi. And the major challenges are the issues of arms. And as a military officer, my challenges were to to make sure the bad boys don't have arms. The former president, Dr. Mahmoud Obadi, said, um, wherever it's not an AK should be shot. I think we should go beyond that. The law should be explicit. Wherever it's found, an automatic weapon should be killed instantly. Akeme Onyamo of the Enugu State Police Command recommended strategies to combat illicit arms possession 
murder, kidnapping, trafficking, and smuggling of weapons. I want us as agencies to cultivate informants. They will give us information. So we should engage our political leaders. Each and every one of us knows what happens. Some of them will be armed. Some of those boys, boys. We can sustain them, let them know the importance, well, let them know what they are doing. Because it's an evil wind that blows nobody good. If somebody is armed, it's not like throwing stone into a marketplace. Onyama also advocates a kind of engagement between the government and local arms manufacturers to help provide arms for the country's security personnel. Some of these uh, arms are from our neighbor villages, community, because we have local manufacturers. Some of them who are engaged in cancer matching, kidnapping, may not have the high caliber arms in ammunition. But some of these local manufacturers are producing arms that use cartridges, the ones that use ammunition. We should engage our manufacturers. They are here, all of them are around. Some of them, if you look at the intelligence the intel community, will feed you with information of where they are located. We should call them up. They can be part of our legal manufacturing and uh, firms. We know where they are in the country. They can be engaged. And so, by so doing, it will be that's very expertise will be used in a positive way. Very correct. Abud Lai Rogo of the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps, Enugu State Command, who spoke with Signature TV, outlined some measures to tackle arms um, proliferation. The most important thing is try to see how you can educate the masses. Because in most cases, you need to educate people. If you don't educate people, enlighten them, tell them the adverse effect of carrying illegal arms and the harm it does to the society. Particularly our use our political elites and then at the same time the traditional rulers. Chairman of the Enugu State Council of Nigerian Union of Journalists, Samuel Udekwe, highlighted the role of the media in sensitizing the public on the ills of arms proliferation. For the media, you see, we have a lot to do. We have constitutional responsibilities of ensuring that the society is better. And that's why we go by sensitization, creating awareness, educating the people. Participants at the seminar are in one accord that there should be greater collaboration and synergy among stakeholders to address the issue of armed proliferation in the southeast and other parts of the country to check the level of insecurity and possibly restore peace and order in the country. Chinemerem Ikebunam reporting for Signature TV. Enugu State Governor Dr. Peter Mba has disclosed that his administration is already engaging investors and developers in power sector to set, to set up electricity generation plans that will drive the state to achieve its targets of $30 billion economy from the $4.4 billion it met the economy in May 2023. The governor, who spoke on Thursday in Enugu as chief host at a town hall organized by the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission with the theme Customer Complaints Resolution Meeting, said the new Enugu Electricity Law empowered the state to develop its own commercially viable electricity market, which is safe, reliable, and sustainable. Following the passage of the law, the governor explained that the state did not waste time in setting up the Inigo State Electricity Regulatory Commission, with commissioners saddled with the responsibility of assuming regulatory authority over electricity services in the state. The River State Governor, Similaya Fubara, says he is committed to working with the Tinubu administration to prosecute policies designed to make life better for Nigerians. Governor Fubara made the remark when members of the Senate had a committee investigating the turnaround maintenance of Nigeria's refineries led by its chairman, Ifan Yoba, paid him a courtesy visit at Government House in Port Harcourt Friday night. 
He said it was for this reason that the state government embarked on the rehabilitation of the Woji Aleto Alessa Refinery Road, now 70% completed to provide a bypass to the Port Harcourt Refinery and take off traffic from the East-West Road. Governor Fubara pointed out that the successful revamping of the refineries will make fuel importation a thing of the past and impact positively on the economy. He regretted that the senator representing his own senatorial district did not want them to come to River State, saying their insistence on making the trip and, and doing what is right is a mark of integrity. The chairman of the Senate Ad Hoc Committee on the Turnaround Maintenance of Nigeria's Refineries, Ifan Yoba, disclosed that the committee was at the Wari Refinery on Thursday and had come to Port Harcourt to investigate the work that has been done and assess the level of preparedness of both the old and new Port Harcourt refinery to recommence operations. He said the committee is pleased with what they saw and observed that the rehabilitation and upgrade are almost 90% completed and expressed confidence that they will commence operations before the end of the year. Abriba community in Ohafia local government area in Abia state has called for justice following the alleged killing of their son, Emmanuel Michael Okocha, by a trigger-happy policeman in Aba. The community alleged that officers from the Rapid Response Squad of the Nigerian Police Force on Friday shot dead the Abriba-born businessman along MCC Abai Aba for allegedly refusing to bribe them despite having a complete vehicle license. A relative who was sitting next to the victim in the car said a team of police officers stopped them and demanded the car documents and driver's license of Mr. Emmanuel Michael Okocha, which he quickly availed them. According to the witness, when the officers demanded the tip and he refused and insisted on continuing his journey, one of the policemen shot at him without provocation. The Abriba community is calling on the state governor, Alex Oti, to intervene to ensure that rogue officers in the police force and other security agencies get the message that the lives of innocent Abia state citizens must be protected without compromise. The Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, FCCPC, has released findings from a comprehensive investigation into the factors contributing to the relentless increase in consumer costs. The Director of Surveillance and Investigation, Mrs. B. A. Adeyinka, said this while briefing journalists during a market surveillance to enforce prices in Masaka markets, Nasrawa State. Speaking on Thursday, the Acting Chief Executive Officer of FCCPC, Adamu Abdullahi, stated that the Commission would continue the price enforcement in other states. The FCCPC, as part of its campaign for compliance, sealed for you supermarkets, who say to, on Thursday for breaching price and quality standards. The 17 residents of the Okwama Ewu community, whose lingering land disputes with the Okoloba community, Bomadi local government area, escalated, leading to the intervention of the soldiers on March 14th, are demanding 200 billion naira in damages from the Nigerian army. The applicants, majorly artisans, whom their suit is before Honorable Justice Ayam Sani of the Federal High Court, are seeking the enforcement of their fundamental human rights. They are suing for themselves and on behalf of the residents of Okwama community. On Thursday, the applicants, through their lawyers, applied for reliefs against the Nigerian army to the tune of 200 billion naira for actions by the Nigerian army that constitutes a flagrant violation of the fundamental human rights of the applicants and that of the residents of the community. Following the applicant's application, the Nigerian army has seven days to respond to the claim. Following the fatal helicopter crash on Thursday, April 18th, which killed 10 people, bodies of victims are being returned to their communities. Kenya military officials, Brigadier General Said Nzaro Swale and Captain Mohamed Karo Sora were laid to rest in their communities of Kilifi and Moyale. Kenya's President William Ruto said the group had been deployed in northwest of the country to combat endemic cattle rustling. Only two soldiers survived the crash and Kenya's military chief, General Francis Ogala, was among those who died. Ruto said an investigation into the cause of the crash had begun. Hundreds of community members attended both funerals to pay their final respects. Ogola will be buried on Sunday, April 21st. South Africans go to the polls on May 29th, with elections falling nearly a month after the 30th anniversary 
of the first post-apartheid elections held on April 27, 1994. South African leaders will mark Freedom Day on Saturday, April 27th with pomp, ceremony and lectures about the sacrifices and achievements of the African National Congress, ANC, in its long struggle for liberation. Ahead of the elections in May, the ANC is likely to lose its parliamentary majority for the first time since Nelson Mandela led it to power at the fall of apartheid 30 years ago. A survey showed opening up the prospect of coalition rule. The survey of voter opinion in February by Johannesburg based think tank, the Brent Horst Foundation, and the Sabi Strategy Group estimated support for the ANC at 39%, down from 41% in October and 44% in November of 2022. The ruling ANC, which spearheaded the fight against apartheid, has remained in power since the end of white minority rule in 1994. Over three quarters of the Brent House Sabi Survey's respondents say they would be happy with a coalition government. The survey showed support for the biggest opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, at 27% up from 23% in October's survey, while support for the far-left Economic Freedom Fighters Party fell to 10% from 17% in October. Potential coalition partners for the ANC could include the largest opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, and the far-left Economic Freedom Fighters Party. Former U.S. President Donald Trump on Friday called the hush money trial a giant witch hunt, but made no mention of the man who set himself on fire outside the court. This is really a concerted witch hunt, very simple. Everything you heard in there, this is a witch hunt by numerous judges, Democrat judges. You take a look at it, and Doran is a whack job. What he did was a disgrace. He's being reviewed by the appellate division. And I hope they do justice because everybody's looking and nobody, no business is coming into the city. None whatsoever. They're looking at that case. That case is a threat to democracy, frankly, what took place with the AG. A crooked AG, Letitia James, who campaigned in the fact, who campaigned in the fact that I'm going to get Trump, I'm going to get Trump. That's all she said for two years. And it's people don't want to see this stuff. We have violent criminals all over the streets of New York and nothing happens. So even when they catch him, they let him go. No bail, no bail whatsoever. So this is just a concerted witch hunt, whether it's Judge Kaplan with a person I have no idea until they called and said they're suing us. I had no idea who this person was or this judge or if you look at Ignorant where he said that Mar-a-Lago which if it was worth a billion or a billion and a half dollars, he said it was worth 18 million dollars because that suited his narrative. But what, what's happening in this city and all over the country, but what's happening in particular in this city, some are very good, by the way, some are very fair. Those are really the cities that are thriving. But what's happening here with the judicial system is an outrage. The shocking development outside came shortly after jury selection for the trial was completed, clearing the way for prosecutors and defense attorneys to make opening statements on Monday in a case stemming from harsh money paid to Pawn Star. Officials later said the man did not appear to have been targeting Trump. The 12 jurors, along with six alternates, will consider evidence in a first ever trial to determine whether a former U.S. president is guilty of breaking the law. Prosecutors intend to call at least 20 witnesses, according to Trump defense lawyer Susan Nichols. Trump may testify on his own behalf in a risky move that would open up to cross-examination. On Friday, a man set himself on fire outside the New York courthouse where Donald Trump's historic hush money trial was taking place as jury selection wrapped up. Max Azarello of St. Augustine, Florida, was identified by police as the man. He burned for several minutes in full view of television cameras that were set up outside the courthouse. Officials say Azarello, who is in his late 30s, survived and was in critical condition at a hospital. Witnesses say the man pulled pamphlets out of a backpack 
and threw them in the air before he doused himself with the liquid and set himself on fire. One of those pamphlets included references to evil billionaires. In an online manifesto, a man using that name said he set himself on fire and apologized to friends, witnesses, and first responders. The post warns of an apocalyptic fascist coup and criticizes cryptocurrency and U.S. politicians, but does not single out Trump in particular. Assembly of the world's largest digital astronomy camera is now complete and ready to ship to its new home atop Cerro Pachon an 8,900-foot mountain in Chile. Engineers and scientists at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory in Menlo Park, California, assembled the 3,200-megapixel camera, which weighs approximately 3,000 kilograms. Once installed, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, LSST, camera will be capable of producing approximately 1,000 images and 15 to 20 terabytes of data a night as scientists use it to study dark energy, dark matter, the distribution of galaxies, and more. Taking a thousand pictures a night is wild. That is not something that is currently done by other telescopes. And so taking that many pictures, in addition to having them being of more of the sky, in addition to having them being able to see really far, is just a really powerful combination of being able to collect a lot of data. The camera will arrive in Chile next month and be installed atop the Simoni Survey Telescope at the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. The public can expect to see the first images from the LSST in 2025. Yulia Navalnaya, the widow of Russian opposition politician Alexia Navalny, said in Germany on Friday, April 19th, that she would continue to fight for media freedom and the work of her late husband so that Russian, Russians who stand against Putin and against war have access to uncensored information they can trust and share. Speaking at a ceremony in Bavaria where she received a press award for a publishing house from her publishing house, Navanaya reiterated earlier remarks that Russian President Vladimir Putin had killed her husband in prison. In an interview with Time magazine published two days earlier, Navanaya said she had hired a bodyguard following a Hammer attack on a senior ally of her late husband. A Hammer-wielding assailant attacked Leonard Volkov, a Navani aide, outside his home in Vilnius, Lithuania, in March, breaking his arm and pounding his leg with a series of blows. And elsewhere, Federation Cup acquires presidential nomenclature. Nigeria's oldest football competition changes name for the sixth time as the Nigerian Football Federation, NFF, collaborates with the Ministry of Sports and GTI to announce a new nomenclature for the knockout competition on Friday. The name for the competition began in 1945 as Governor's Cup, but due to changes in the Nigerian constitution, the annual general meeting of the then Nigerian Football Association, NFA, on February 28, 1955, changed the name to All Nigerian Challenge Cup, simply called the Challenge Cup. The name endured for decades until it was changed to Coca-Cola FA Cup in 1996 for sponsorship reasons. Nigeria Sports Minister John Owen Eno, under whose supervision the Nigerian Football Knockout Competition changed name, narrated that what began as Governor's Cup and later changed to Challenge Cup, Coca-Cola FA Cup, Federation Cup, ITO Cup, and Tingo Cup is now President Federation Cup. He explained that the essence is to return charm to the competition that was previously very glamorous, also to give it a presidential backing, which is the highest office in Nigeria. The minister stated further that his initiative of the agreement with GTI was to raise the standard of National Football Cup competition President of the Nigerian Football Federation, Ibrahim Gusso, explained that, the rebrand, that rebranding the National Cup was necessary to give it a presidential backing similar to the Throne Cup in Morocco. Fifth seeded Stefanos Sissipa swatted aside an upset attempt and recorded a 4 6 6 3 7 6 8 victory over Argentina's Facundo Diaz Acosta Friday, April 19th, to reach the semi finals in Spain. 
Acosta led 6-5 in the third set and later had a match point in the tie break before Sisipa won four of the final five points to win the match. Sisipa of Greece overcame seven double faults. Sisipa will face Dusan Lajovic in the semi-finals after the Serbian notched a 6-4, 3-6, 6-2 victory over 16-seeded Arthur Fields of France. Third-seeded Kaspar Rudd of Norway will face 13-seeded Thomas Martin Echeverri of Argentina in the other semi-final. Rudd beat at Italian Matteo Arnaldi 6-4, 6-3, while Echeverri defeated 12th-seeded Brit Cameron Nori 7-6-4, 761. And that's the news on Signature TV this hour. My name is Charles Pyers. Have a good day.